who owns the moon? A frivolous question? Sounds like a frivolous question? Hardly. Far from it. This question is now growing in its importance to great proportions. Why? Because there are people who lay a claim on celestial real estate. Real estate is not only here, the civil engineers here would, should recognize real estate is everywhere. So this is a damned serious question. <coughs> I'll give you a few examples, hard to believe, but true. Some of them outright comical. Yet, occasionally, or more often than not, truth is stranger than fiction. A few examples. 1936, a man called Dean Lindsay, American, he goes to a magistrate's court and registers a claim that all the celestial bodies belong to him. That's all. I told you, I warned you, some of them are outright comical. In 1949, Robert Heinstein, he wrote a story, the man who sold the moon. You have heard of people who have sold the uh, Eiffel Tower in Paris. But this is a little farther away than Eiffel Tower. 1980, a man called Dennis Hope, an entrepreneur, he declared himself as the lunar chief, head of lunar embassy on Earth. And he put up an advertisement, real estate on moon for sale. And very cheap indeed. One acre plots, $22 plus tax. And would you believe he managed to sell two and a half million one acre plots thanks to the gullibility of people like us, not only the Americans. Oh, this may be the funniest of all. Somebody comes up, a German, Martin Jurgens, he challenges Dennis Hope, who sold two and a half million plots. He said, this man Dennis Hope has no right over moon. Way back in 1756, on July 15th, one of his ancestors, ancestors was given this as a gift by the Prussian king, Frederick the Great, for services rendered. He shows some papers, of course, and much more recent, 2016. A wealthy Russian rocket engineer, his name is Igor Asher Bailey, he declares himself to be the head of a new independent nation, a virtual nation. That is no reality, it's a virtual nation and he called it Asgardia. This word Asgardia is borrowed from Norse mythology, it means the heavenly abode or the place where gods live, right? And he put up advertisement for volunteers to be citizens of this state, Asgardia. And again, 200,000 volunteers have become members of that space nation, Asgardia, space nation. And he intends to apply for UN membership. And the purpose of Asgardia is to break free from the controlling force of all the space-faring nations in the world and get free access to space. And he also undertakes that he will defend humanity against space disasters like asteroids, space debris, and so on and so forth. And eventually to set up a human settlement elsewhere in some planet, maybe the moon. But for a long while to come, the citizens of Asgardia will have to stay on the earth because Azure Bailey hopes to set up this plant or the settlement only in 2043. They have to be on the ground. But he has plans to set up or launch satellites for a starter. And mind you, in 2017, 
he launched a satellite weighing only two and a half kilograms. It's in the orbit. And it carried the biodata, you know, the profiles of about 100,000 members, citizens of that Asgardia. It is somewhere there, up there in space. So, you know, look, some of these people are very serious about these things, which seem to us to be ridiculous. Space is a real estate. I mean, a resource. 1957 saw the dawn of space age, with the launch of the Soviet Union, Soviets, Unions, Sputnik 1. And thousands of objects have been sent by human beings out into space. They are all there. Some of them still functioning, some of them useless debris. But it's no 60, more than 60 years ago, but within the first 10 years, within the first decade itself, humanity or UN got wise about it. They decided in 1967, this can't be allowed to go on like this without any control. So, there came a UN space treaty. By the way, the American poet Robert Frost, he has written in one of the poems, good fences make good neighbors, at least in theory. So when aviation started, early part of last century, there, there was necessity felt for airspace regulations. 1957, space age starts. There was a need for space laws. And laws are like good fences. Fences can be broken, and so can laws be too. All the previous examples which I showed you may sound like comical, but now here it's a serious one. There is a claim from certain quarters of the United States of America that the site where Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, the Sea of Tranquility, should be declared as the National History Landmark. It almost amounts to appropriating that area. By the way, only in the US, I think there are over 2,500 such historical landmarks, and they want to add this one but there are problems. Now let's look at the Outer Space Treaty of UN, 1967, that is just 10 years after the launch of Sputnik. There are 17 articles, forget the rest of them. The first article says, that is all that I would deal with. <coughs> I have to, see, we have to read it verbatim. The exploration and use of outer space, including the moon and celestial bodies, shall be carried out for the benefit and, the, and in the interest of all nations, meaning members of United Nations, irrespective of their degree of economic or scientific development. And the operative part shall be the province of all mankind. We might think that phrase, province of all mankind, it defines everything beyond doubt. Not so, we will see later. Look, as long as there are lawyers, they will split hairs about these words. And when they stop it, their families will have to starve. Prohibits national appropriation of space by claim of national sovereignty or occupation or any other means. You know, I said a, a moment earlier, when the Americans propose to set up or call a historical landmark in the, on the moon where Neil Armstrong, the Apollo 11 mission, they landed. That is not enough of a reason to give them sovereignty over that area. It is all written in 1967. And the third one, however, Article 8 gives permission or right over objects deposited there. Various people, Americans, um, Russians, Indians, all of them, now Chinese, they have landed objects there. They have right over that object, but not over the territory where they fell or where they were installed, right? And yet another, very important, prohibits all military uses like positioning in space, nuclear weapons, or weapons of mass destruction. 
right? All this is fine. You have the Ten Commandments from the Bible. Who obeys them? And the Eleventh Commandment says, none of the above applies. <laughs> no, ten, about 12 years later, in 1979, people thought that was not enough. The old even outer space treaty was not enough. So they wrote down, some people sat down and wrote what came to be known by its short name, the Moon Treaty, which is somewhat more rigid and strict. It invokes the principle of common heritage of mankind. Mind you, I mentioned earlier, province of all mankind. Here we come across a new phrase, principle of common heritage of mankind. This makes life difficult. Because you have to, already we know the definition of common heritage. That is held in trust for posterity, for future generations. It should be preserved. Examples, Antarctica, it belongs to no one. Deep sea bed belongs to no one. Or in other words, belongs to everyone jointly. So the moon treaty stipulates that it, it should be operated on principles of common heritage of mankind. That is, we have inherited and we have to preserve it for future generations. And forbids private ownership of space. This space does not mean celestial bodies alone. An orbit, mind you, a satellite orbit is a resource. It is space. We have to get advanced permission to launch a park a satellite in some location. And star, very important. It stipulates, you know, space, the objects in space, celestial bodies, asteroids, they're full of valuable resources, minerals, heavy metals, and particularly, let me mention helium-3, which is an isotope of helium, which is not there at all on the Earth, but millions of tons of helium-3 is available for your taking on the Moon. And what is so special about helium-3 is an ideal, clean, fu nuclear fusion fuel. One kilogram of helium-3 along with about 700 grams of deuterium, that is heavy hydrogen, through the process of a nuclear fusion can produce, you know how much? 170 million kilowatt hours. 170 million units of electrical energy. It's no small thing. And are you surprised people will fight over these things? Will not fight or will fight? And here is a condition. Resources brought from space by any nation should be redistributed to others under proper international arrangement. Do you think anybody would agree? You see, given the technological advance today, mining of other celestial objects is not far away. You people will see it in your own lifetime. And do you think a very advanced nation technologically go there, mine, bring some material, for example, helium-3, would be willing to redistribute to the others who did nothing? Ah, by the way, <coughs> between these two, 1967 and 1979, two treaties. The first one was by and large effective, but the second one, no, it is almost a failure. You know the reason why? First of all, it was signed only, only by about 14 or 17 num nations and none of them is a space-faring nation. It's a repetition. Moon Treaty also repeats, no sovereignty for to anyone. And <coughs> ownership banned. Or any, any extraterrestrial property by an organization or person, unless the organization is international and governmental. It's a very pious statement. Next, very important, something related to, you know, uh, contamination. We go to various places in space and everywhere we leave, or we leave it contaminated. So it prohibits contamination. And now, <coughs> we have seen all this. Do you really think these are practicable? I mentioned to you, who wouldn't like to use helium-3 brought from the moon? One kilogram, 170 million kilowatt hours. And 
what stands against all these pious words? Human nature. We know human nature very well. Laws are laws. Human nature is invariant. Selfishness, greed, aggressiveness, right? The UN Treaty might say you should not convert space to a, an arena of warfare. But no treaty can stop, can prevent these innate human nature, selfishness, greed and aggressiveness. We know the simple principle, might is right. And muscle power of course backed by brain power, that is might. And we know there are a few powerful nations in this world. I don't want to name them, you know them. They are not going to allow other nations to share with them the valuable or precious resources brought from elsewhere. And by the way, a simple common sense principle, law, is only for the law abiding. <laughs> right? If you don't care for a law, what can the law do against you? Nothing. We, have, we see so many people driving a car, making a phone call. Unless they are caught, on, caught by some camera, they will go unpunished, right? So, law is for the law abiding, very, very important. Now the main point is, during all these 60 odd years, we have done so much in space. It is unbelievable when I compared, when I started my career, way back in 1966. It was nothing like this. It was even three years before the moon landing. Moon landing was in 69. But after, as far as moon is concerned, from 69 or rather from 72 onwards, there has been a lull. No man ever stepped on the moon since 1972. But no, there are plants. So anyway, the space is there alluring, seductively alluring with all her resources right, tempting us, all these will become a reality, so we must positively develop a new humanism. Way back in 1968, before even man landed on the moon, there was a spacecraft which orbited around the moon, and on the Christmas Eve, 25th of December 1968, the, an astronaut who did not land on the moon, from the orbiting vehicle around the moon, he took a photograph of the earth. This became well known as the earth rise. And when an American poet, Archibald MacLeish, saw this, he was inspired and jotted down these lines. To see the earth as it really is, is to see the riders on the earth together, brothers, in that bright loveliness in eternal cold. I have no better words than this, um, um, than uh, Archibald MacLeish's. This is the kind of humanism we must develop regardless all the technological advances we make in foreseeable future, not only in space, everywhere, right? And thanks for pa your patience. <laughs>